If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back. We have uh, Major Patton Zainz here with us. He'll always be known for free to battalion. Uh, welcome back here. Uh, I appreciate your time and uh, thank you for that. Uh, but today I think we're moving on. You've left three to battalion. You're now heading down south, I suppose, back to Oatswara, to uh, the School of Infantry. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much. Um, that's correct. Now I um, I had my time there, three to battalion, and um, and I decided to uh, to find another place to go to, and eventually it turned out to be a School of Infantry in Oatswara. Now. I arrived there um, in January of uh, 1987, and um, I was then appointed as the the two IC of a uh, hotel company. Now, hotel company and Echo Company; those were the companies that cleared in uh, in June and July of the year. So, some of them of these guys were already finished. Uh, their studies and others were half finished with their studies uh, but those were the only two companies in infantry school that cleared in uh, halfway in the year so <clears throat> i arrived there um, i was uh, taken to my accommodation uh, which was actually very nice now i'm staying in the officer's mess with uh, i had two rooms one uh, adjacent to each other and what I sort of uh, made one of the rooms my sitting room so I felt like um, I've, I'm living in a, in a, in a flat now um, and I, when I arrived there the officer commanding was uh, Colonel Schultz the uh, two IC was Commandant Nivot the RSM was uh, uh, Skirman and the and the edge was uh, Alex Smith. So I joined the hotel company and my company commander was uh, Major Mike Smith. Um, Major Mike Smith was a, a career officer. He was a very uh, excellent officer. He was a perfectionist in a way. Um, and, I, and I think he was quite suited for, for infantry school uh, because he did things the right way. And I think that is probably the way you have to do it there. So I was the maybe maybe the, the rough diamond there, but um, I, I I enjoyed it. Um, so we were actually there uh, training the guys. Now they were half were halfway through their session already, and we um, we had to now prepare them to go to uh, Oshivelo, where they would then do their the coin insurgency training um, for a month. And then after that, you would uh, deploy in Ovambuland uh, and do your month or so, and then go back to infantry school. So um, <clears throat> I, we then left for, for Chevelo, uh, did some training there, and then um, we had to deploy. Um, at that stage, uh, Colonel Echo uh, Victor uh, Eddie Falluni, he was now the previous commander of 32 Battalion, and he was appointed as the uh, staff, senior staff officer of operations for Sector 1-0. And obviously, you hear a lot about uh, School of Infantry, and they have to now deploy New Bumberland. Uh, so... I gave him a quiet call and asked him, is it not possible for us to, to do a little bit of um, trans operations and not deploy directly into a bomber land, which was actually, I think, uh, not always allowable. But yeah, we then eventually went to, uh, uh, the base was called Hurricane, that's uh, near, uh, in Ruakana. So we deployed from there. Mike and myself made the turns to go out with the troops. So it was quite an interesting time there. We did, uh, the company did 
did very, very well. Um, and probably one of the best deployments that the School of Infantry um, have had up to that stage. Um, and it was obviously a, a big responsibility now to have these young men under you and, uh, and you have to make sure that, that the deployment goes uh, the way it should go. Well, eventually we uh, finished off our deployment there and uh, went back to School of Infantry. Obviously welcomed there by the, uh, like they normally do, there's a band at the uh, airport in Oetzorum and everybody's waiting for the companies to uh, get back. And everybody was glad to have us there. And uh, I was called into, uh, into the Colonel's office and uh, obviously myself and Mike, and they congratulated us on, on, the, on the good deployment. And he suggested that uh, that was a Friday evening that we, would, uh, we, would, we must maybe uh, take the whole company and give them a pass and they can all go out that uh, Friday night. Now, I, I personally, I didn't think it was a good idea, but uh, who am I now to, to counter that idea? So uh, we, we, then, we then did go out and um, luckily nothing unforeseen happened. And uh, the next morning we, we actually had a, uh, a poiking course competition where the whole unit was now together. And that was already organized previously by our, uh, our pre-team that, that went back to Otsuram before we actually arrived there. Now, as it's uh, done in the School of Infantry, you also write orders for a party. So everything is like the situation, the mission, the execution, the admin and lock, uh, the, the command and signals. So every, everything was organized. So I actually only arrived there the morning and uh, we had all these stalls there and the Colonel and two IC and everybody else was there. And I remember there was a lot of uh, Wittblitz uh, stalls because that's an area well known for Wittblitz. And obviously, as things go uh, by, uh, we had a few of these Wittblitz and shared it and everybody was happy. I also had a, a band that played there to the annoyance of, of the rest um, of the companies. And uh, the day went well. Um, the next morning was uh, Sunday and I slept in a little bit and uh, normally when you have lunch each company has its own table and then uh, all the officers uh, would sit down there the NCOs would have another mess where they would eat and when I actually entered the, the mess hall everything went quiet and my seat was now on the head, on the head of the table, was still open, so I uh, joined my table, and everybody's quiet, and there's a lot of whispering going on. So I thought, well, uh, and I said, uh, what's the situation here? And they said, uh, you can't remember what you did yesterday? So I said, yeah, I can, um, but uh, enlighten me. So it actually turned out that I think that because of maybe too many of these wet blitzes, when it, <clears throat> when it got to the time when we had now the presentation or the best poiki uh, or the best company, the, the best stalls, every time the Colonel uh, wanted to announce the winners, I, used, I stood up and I went forward. Obviously I, we didn't get any prizes, but I tried my best every time, but that was a, <laughs> I think I'd lost, uh, I lost uh, that piece of uh, exercise. So I knew that the Monday morning I was going to uh, obviously be on orders again. But I had a company photographer. So I phoned him that afternoon, the Sunday. And I said to him, did you take photos of, of all uh, that happened? He said, yes. So I said, well, we'll have to develop this before my orders on one o'clock uh, Monday 
afternoon, which we then did. And um, I had about 10 photos of the activities on the Saturday. And then obviously the Colonel was in some of those activities. Uh, so I was taken on orders and I, I got, got a little bit of a scrubbage. And when, when he finished with me, he said, do I want to say something? So I said, yes, I just want to say that I also have a, a little bit of evidence and I took some photos, we took some photos, took the liberty of taking some photos for the company uh, book and uh, I gave him the photos. So he had a look at the photos <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said to the edge, uh, take this man out of my office and give him 300 um, rand for his uh, company fund. <laughs> so he <laughs> so, uh, chased me out of there. So that didn't turn out too badly. Um, but I had um, quite a good relationship with Colonel Schultz, uh, Annie Schultz, because I've had a few uh, incidents. Well, I've visited his office uh, regularly when on course. And I remember this one time when I think we did company commander's course. Now, I don't know how it happens, but when you do go on course, it's like you've seen and you, and you, and you see the guys and from all over that's coming to the course now, it's like there's a, there's a switch that you put on. Uh, it's like everybody is now glad to see each other. It's like you haven't seen your friends for a long time. And during the year, you don't normally see them if they're in other units. So it's like there's a, a free pass to get in trouble type of thing. So we always, <laughs> we always heard this story about Colonel Schultz. Now there's a lot of rumors, some are true, some are not true, but we had to find out this specific story was that um, he could play a piano very well. And he also had a big trommel in his house full of snubs, you know, different kinds of liqueurs. Um, so one day, uh, we decided, we, uh, we went to town, a lot of us went to town, officers went to town, and after we came back from the town, it was about one o'clock in the evening, we decided we're going to go and visit him. So we did that. We knocked on his doors, but we, we sort of uh, did a formation uh, attack on his uh, lawn. So everybody was deployed on his lawn, and uh, I was now at the door knocking and he opened up the door and he says, yes, what can I do for you? So I said, um, well, I'm sorry that it's so late, but we heard the story about, uh, and I told him the story and I said, you know what time it is? He says, I said, well, it's now one o'clock in the morning. He says, uh, you, <laughs> you don't work tomorrow? I said, yes, we do. I said, but you just have a look at the back. Um, there's, a, there's a few guys that's tempted now to do an attack, a frontal attack. So eventually he said, come inside. So he's in his, his, uh, his pajamas. Uh, so he opened up the trommel and uh, poured us a few uh, synopsis. They woke, he woke his wife up. He played piano and, uh, and we had a chance to dance with his wife one round. And then he chased us out there. Obviously, <laughs> <laughs> needless to say, <laughs> the next day we were on orders again. So that's how I knew Colonel Schultz and uh, yeah, uh, had a good relationship with him. He could play hard, but he can also work hard. So that was the, the situation. How I got there, didn't want to go there initially, but I started enjoying my time there now. And, um, I was going to get married, so my wife were, were, were gonna, she was going to come down to Otsuaram, join me there. Now you've got a house, you've got a job. What can go wrong? I mean, it's it's an it's ideal situation. And you're outside of uh, the danger area, and you, sell, and you sort of uh, get into that routine 
there's still a great responsibility that, that you have. You have to prepare these young boys to, uh, to eventually deploy, to go to the units which they then choose. And I think it's a great responsibility in the sense that uh, maybe because myself, I've been to the war, so I know what it is. And then you take that responsibility uh, seriously because you have to prepare them 100%. You can't send somebody out there that's not prepared. And that is something that I, that I took seriously and that I um, think was, was a, a thing that I, that I sort of uh, took on myself to say, okay, what we can do for them, uh, we should. And uh, the best we can prepare them, the better for themselves. And, um, and that's where Mike uh, Smith was an excellent uh, company commander because he, he also had that same attitude. Obviously, from my side, I could uh, inject some ideas that obviously worked where we came from. So these guys had knowledge and you could put your knowledge and give your knowledge back to, to, um, to the people that you're actually training. And that's, that I think is, is, is uh, why the School of Infantry is, is so important. You have to uh, um, be dedicated to, it, to do it properly. And I, I realized then that uh, how lucky we, we were, those of us who were, uh, uh, who had experience in the war, that your life is not in your own hands. It's uh, maybe you have a certain input uh, every now and then, but otherwise it's not actually in your hand, it's in a higher hand. And that's why I also think uh, about um, my friends, Fred Turner, Mike Baston, those were guys that also served with me and, 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 and even other people, but uh, those specifically those two that I knew very well that actually lost their lives uh, much earlier than one would have wanted, but, uh, and they've been uh, actually wounded in war, but then they lose their lives in, in, in Savvy Street uh, by accident. And, um, and I realized that, yes, that maybe we were lucky, maybe we have a responsibility, and I, and I, took, it, uh, I took that seriously. Um, so yeah, I'm now prepared. I'm happy that I'm there. Uh, you living in a town, it's a nice environment. Some weekends you are off and you can go visit uh, George, Naisna, those places. Evenings you could go to a movie. So it was a totally different environment that I was used to. But after a few months, I started enjoying it. And uh, I, I was looking forward to, uh, to getting married and, and uh, start my career. And, and uh, see where it goes to. So that's what I thought, actually. Um, so one day in May of that year, I was again called on orders, but uh, I knew that I didn't do anything wrong that time, so it must have been something else. So when I got to orders, um, I was informed by the colonel that, that I was now uh, appointed as the Private Secretary of the Minister of Defense, General Magnus Milan. Um, and I received a signal um, saying this, indicating that I have to now report there to the ministry in a certain period of time. And I asked uh, politely if I can see the signal, which, I, which he then gave me and I, I read it. And in the signal, it said that you have, you have to be uh, unmarried. So obviously, I immediately took that gap and, uh, and said, well, I, I can't do it because, because I'm getting married uh, in a few months' time. And secondly, I can't type. I don't have the demeanor uh, for that type of job. Um, I don't have any telephone uh, etiquette. Um, so it's, it's not the job for me. I mean, it's, it was a, a bridge too far from... I just left uh, three to after five years and now they want me to go 
and be the private secretary of the Minister of Defence, that is definitely not happening. So I told him politely that uh, he, he must please inform the ministry that I, I can't accept this job, I'm not coming. So uh, he told me that <laughs> that's not the way this works and I can't do that. Um, I have to take the job. I said, no, it's, it's, it's impossible. If they don't want to tell him, I will personally go and have a meeting and then um, explain my situation to them. And um, well, he said, well, he'll, he, then you must do it. So the, uh, the weekend on a Friday, I got a, a military vehicle from the Colonel and I drove to Cape Town and uh, visited my mother on the weekend. And on the Monday morning, I had an appointment with uh, the military secretary of uh, the minister, uh, Brigadier Gerd Opperman. So I got there and explained to him the situation uh, that it's not possible for me to do this because uh, of the different reasons. And I also asked him, but how the hell did they get my name? Who? I mean, I was never uh, asked about this and I was never informed. Uh, nobody gave me a chance to say my thing. And now they just want to appoint me. So he explained to me that uh, they send out a signal once in a blue moon when they need a secretary and uh, to all the units and also to uh, all the, the arms of the Defence Force, like Navy, uh, Air Force, Infant, I mean, and, and uh, the Army itself. And they had uh, 360 applications and they decided without... Uh, interview me that they want to, they'll take me. So, which was fine. I mean, it was a little uh, compliment. It was a big compliment actually, but still I couldn't see myself doing this job. And um, I had to now go and tell the minister uh, and accompanied obviously by the brigadier that uh, this is now the situation. I think Herb knew that uh, what was coming. Um, so he, what could he do? He played along and uh, I've met the minister a few times in, in Arundu and in Buffalo and also uh, in other, uh, other places. So I knew him. Uh, I've spoken to him a few times. And I, I, uh, so I knew of him. And uh, I went to um, his office um, and he came out of his office greeted me and said, how's it going? And we'll see you this afternoon because he had to go to parliament. And uh, I was now sitting there with the other private secretary, um, Major Cecile Berger, uh, a very competent lady. And uh, normally the minister has two secretaries. Uh, the one is, the, is a male and the other is a female. And obviously there's obvious reasons, uh, there's different job descriptions, uh, but she was like a very effective hands-on type of uh, officer. And later on, we, we, had a, we formed a great team. She was an excellent woman to work with. So I waited there and I got introduced to the rest of the staff as if I am now already part of this uh, team. But like I said, I'm, I'm waiting now to tell him, to tell the minister this is, uh, it's not happening. So I think it was late in the afternoon, uh, we, we got our, uh, our innings and I, we sat down there with the minister, talked a little bit about the birds and the bees and then uh, do business. So, um, he said that he heard from the brigadier that I'm not uh, satisfied uh, with his appointment and what's the reason. And um, I said, well, it's just not that I don't feel competent about this. I cannot do it. I, ex I gave him all the reasons I gave the brigadier that I'm getting married. So he said, uh, so he's negating all the problems that I'm giving him. He's just negating. He said, well, that rule we just changed and you can get married. What's next? So the next one is that uh, I can't, 
work with a computer, I can't type. Is it not necessary? You can dictate there's a pool of typists here. What's next? Oh, the next one that I don't have the demeanor for this. No, we can work on that. Um, so I thought the last one, <laughs> so I gave a lot of reasons why I'm not capable of doing this job and why I don't want to do this job. And I said to him, you know, um, once you get here, you don't get away here and your corpse will forget about you and your military career is done and dusted. It's out of the door. So um, I said, that's maybe the main reason why I don't want, want to, uh, to work here. Now, normally, um, the private secretary, the male private secretary of the minister, is, is uh, normally from the, the personnel corps, um, HR departments, that type of uh, profile. But I think he already knew that he wanted um, specifically uh, infantry and infantier, and um, now this specific job fell on me. Um, and that when I told him that uh, I'm not prepared to sit here for a few years and my corps are going to forget about me and I don't know what my career is going to be in the military ahead. So he said, okay, but we'll phone your commander. So he phoned Colonel Schultz. Now, what can Colonel Schultz now say? He said, I'm sitting here with Buttons Haynes and he's, and he's not uh, willing to accept the job. What, uh, what do you say? So he said, no, sir, you mean, <laughs> you can take him, it's no problem. And he said, yeah, but uh, he doesn't want to work here for a long time. He only wants to work here for, a, he's got conditions here. No, <laughs> it sounds funny now, but it's really, um, it wasn't funny at that time. I was just dead serious that I do not want to go there. So he said, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make an arrangement with you. We'll just keep him for one year and then we'll send him back. So what can Colonel Shu say? He said, yes, it's fine. But now I'm still not convinced. Um, so, so he said to me, that's fine. I put the phone down and um, he said, that's fine. You can go back to your unit, clear out, and we see you in a, a week or two. That was the end of the discussion. And uh, I knew I'm not going to get out of here. So I said, okay, what one last thing that I wanted to say is if I do come and work here, I would want to wear my fully, uh, my full uniform, my, my three to battalion associated uniform. So with my camouflage beret, with my, 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 uh, my buckle, my belt, my affiliation belt, so that people can see that I'm from 32 Battalion, not from the personnel corps, not that I say there's something wrong with it, but I want to know, at least show that I'm, uh, although I'm a private secretary, I'm also a capable soldier. And um, yeah, that was how I ended up with a minister. And a few weeks later, I did start uh, to work there. Uh, a total culture shock for me. Um, they gave me a expense allowance to go and buy now suits. I had uh, somebody to accompany me to choose the clothing that's appropriate for that specific job. Um, I moved into a, a small uh, flat. Uh, where I used to stay for six months and then six months in Pretoria. Um, so that was the start of that, uh, that journey, which turned out to be a wonderful time, uh, a wonderful two and a half years of my life, uh, where I learned an exceptional amount of uh, things, knowledge that I picked up about people, about negotiating, about... Uh, yeah, just about the rest of the world, how politics put, uh, how, how that sort of gets together, um, what the role of the military and politics is and uh, how they fit into each other. Yeah, so that is a, a story that uh, I think we can also maybe touch on later because there is a, a, a wonderful uh, experiences that I've had over those two and a half years. Um, 
yeah, that is basically how I got there. Although I didn't want to be there, it turned out to be uh, probably one of my best two and a half years in my life. Well, we're damn glad you did go there because I know in the next episode we're going to talk about that two and a half years and it gives us an absolute unique insight on what happened. So I was, I'm, I'm really glad that they shanghai you against your will and got you there. <clears throat> but i got a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind. Yes. I once sat in Bloemfontein and I saw the, a paratrooper walking past when he was wearing your berets, one of your camouflage berets, and he looked like a soldier. Man, he looked like a soldier. He, he was a tough guy. No doubt about it. Um, is that allowed that you could then go to the infantry school and wear your old beret? Or would you would normally uh, use, you know, the green infantry one? In the beginning, it was um, that you have to be, wear the beret of that specific unit. But later on, with uh, what they call the aff affiliation dress, is that they then um, brought out the, the different... Uh, and how it actually worked, let me explain it like this. So you would then, say for instance, you are now in 3-2 battalion, you would wear your 3-2 battalion beret. Then you would be an infantier and you would wear a book copy with your, um, with your emblem saying that, indicating that you are an um, infant, infantress. You can also maybe be a, a signaler and then you will wear that beret, but you will show on your head that you're actually a signal in the signal core. Then on your, on your lapels on the side, you would um, on the one side wear um, from what uh, core you are. In, in, in other words, infantry on the other side, you would wear the lapel of the unit that you are affiliated to. In other words, three to battalion. Then you will have your stable belt, which would um, indicate uh, the belt itself would indicate that you would uh, be an uh, infantier or a signaler or a whatever call you are in. And then the buckle would be the three to buckle or the buckle that your specific call would have and your unit would have. So this is how you can then identify a person. So for instance, somebody gets transferred to, uh, to the Parabats now, they're wearing the three to beret plus their uh, um, bulky and then the, the lapel. So you can, you can, if you go from the top to bottom, you can see, okay, he's actually, his mother unit is 32 battalion, but now he's in the Parabats. And this is how you can identify a person uh, because of the affiliation dress. Were you feeling a bit old there amongst the 18 years old, 19 year old kids who just arrived? And I don't mean it wrongly, I just say you were a bit older than them. I'm not actually, um, like I said, I mean, obviously the staff, the, the senior staff in the company uh, are all permanent force. And uh, you know, so they've been there for. Um, they're all career soldiers, so they've been there for a long time. My um, company in, in, in outsourcing was, like I said, a hotel company. Those guys have studied. Uh, so most of the, my troops and officers that became platoon commanders, they were a little bit more older. But it was like, it was actually um, funny in a way, when you think back about it, that... Uh, and I think that's the way it differs from maybe the police. And now you get to a school of infantry and you're taking 18 and 19 year people, guys and you must now prepare them to be, a, to be a, pro, a, 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 a competent soldier by the age of 90 and send them to war. Uh, where it won't happen like that in the police. I mean, you, you, uh, you have senior people, you have You'll have to spend a few years in a in a specific rank before you get to a lieutenant or a sub lieutenant or a sergeant. I mean, it's not. 
but after one year of of training, you have to take a child and make him a man in a year's time. So it it is it's difficult, and I think that's the difference between the two, maybe the police and and uh, and the military. But obviously, we didn't have a choice then um, because there was a war. And you did very well, I have to say. In the police, you had to stay two years in a rank minimum. It doesn't matter even if you had a degree, unless, of course, you knew the generals. But mostly, you could not find a lieutenant on the VH of 24, 25. And then he's already had six, seven years' experience. And uh, it counts. On the mean streets, that actually counts. I have an American here, uh, one of the American people who's watching the show, and thank you for that. But he made an interesting comment, which I will, which I will repeat to you. He says in the U.S. Army, we have something which we call the Ranger Units. And originally, these Rangers started off as a core of leaders. So they would take these guys from the infantry, put them through a quite a tough course for three months. And then the idea was to send them back to the units to act as, as leaders. Um, of course, they also then formed the Ranger Battalions, which is yeah. only the Rangers themselves. Would you say that in a certain way, the School of Infantry is exactly that? It, it trains leaders, and therefore it can be said, even though it's much longer, it's four times longer, <clears throat> it is a sort of a ranger school from that sense. <clears throat> no, I don't think so. I think it's totally different. Um, the School of Infantry is where you have uh, to train a uh, non-commissioned officer and the an officer uh, from the basics of section leader up to the to the level of where they can now take command of a platoon. So it's the basics. You start off um, at the section and you build up until you are now capable of commanding 30 people. Um, I think that is the main uh, core and just of why the School of Infantry is there. Obviously, afterwards, when you do join the, uh, the permanent uh, force, then you go back to that school and then there's other courses that you can do to qualify yourself into a, uh, a proper career soldier. And then it's also um, very similar to the police in the sense that you have to stay in a specific rank for a specific time. And you also have to do specific courses before you can be promoted to another rank. Um, so then, then it's, it's, it's basically very similar. I think um, with the Rangers, it's a situation of, I would say, um, it's more, it's, 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 it's more uh, specialized. Um, and I would say that uh, if, let me take an example like this. So you finish the school of infantry and then you are deployed or uh, then you join 32 battalion. There you become a professional infantry and a guerrilla war fighter. That is now your speciality because that is what we did. So you can either specialize in that and that is what we did and obviously do other courses as well. Um, and I think uh, that's maybe the difference between the two. Um, I think also maybe something that might be close to that is where you would now um, leave, say, 32 Battalion and join uh, five reconnaissance or one of the reconnaissance commands, and we become even more specialized in what you do. And they can then, for uh, pollination purposes, send those people back again to retrain those guys that, uh, that they've served before. So I think that's the difference between the School of Infantry and maybe what they had with the Rangers. I now have a question for you regarding training. When you arrived back as a company commander, second in command, um, was the training much different from what you experienced five years before when you were there as a, as a troop? 
Yeah, I think by then, um, you must also remember that the School of Infantry and all the other core schools adapt as well. So they change and they learn and they've, they have departments uh, in those schools that specifically look at that. So it's, there's a training wing that uh, does all uh, the curriculums for the training that you are supposed to now give to the, to the troops. And um, I think with, with uh, obviously lessons learned, uh, and that is why in the military, uh, when you've had a, a operation or a specific uh, battle, there's always after action reports that's written about that. And that is where lessons learned uh, can be applied. So they take those documents, uh, declassify them and take the lessons that's, that you've learned, whether good ones or bad ones or the mistakes that you've made. And um, out of that uh, new uh, material will be written and the uh, doctrines will be changed. So yes, it was, a, it was definitely a little bit uh, different. Um, and by then it was more, uh, it, it, it was, I, I was aware of the fact that a lot of work have been, have been put in because now it's five, six years later and, and there's been a lot of specific battles in, in those times. Um, yeah. And even, even when you go on courses, like when we did specific courses while studying three two. When you do go on a specific course, there's a lot of discussion during those courses with the lecturers about, yeah, lessons learned, and uh, they would apply that eventually. I'm going to ask you a bit of a, a skew ball type of question here. What would you consider is the three most important things to teach an uh, infantry soldier going off to war? Yeah, I would say, uh, I would say just for me, it is to be honest with yourself, to be just, and uh, to be loyal. Um, and when I say honest to, uh, with yourself, I also think it's a situation of what's your circle of competence. So, and that's why it's important. You can't do something halfway when you go to war. You have to do it properly. But there's so many things that can go wrong because it's still humans that do what they do. There's so many cogs that must work together. And it's very important to realize that you are part of this whole team. And uh, that's why there's never a, a thing like a stupid question. So. If you do not understand it or you're not capable of doing it, you, know, you should put up your hand immediately and say so, so that future problems or accidents or even death can be uh, avoided. I've heard a joke, it's from artillery people. I was told this by an army officer, he was not an artillery man. So he might be you know, not liking him for some reason. But he said to me when he did the staff course, the senior one, they realized that the army had a certain way of doing things when they shoot these cannon or this. And they would find a guy, one guy was standing about 100 yards away, he was just standing there. And that they found a bit peculiar. And so we asked him, the gun team captain or whatever you call it, why is that guy standing there? And he says he doesn't know. He's standing there because the manual says he stands there. Now that bothered him. And so they looked at it, looked at it, and they traced it back to the time when they started horses 50 years ago. And this guy was holding the horses. But of course, now they don't have horses anymore. It's just a joke. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to insult the artillery people here, please. If you, if you want to come and talk to us, we'd be welcome. Did you ever find that, Oatswaring, that people were being trained for things which you knew in your heart was a little bit 
outdated or perhaps not not that important anymore. I was think, um, yeah, it, it, in the beginning it, it it is like that because when you start off with your uh, section section training section leader training, it's it was more uh, more conventional orientated, um, and maybe still doctrines from the Second World War. But obviously that changed a lot over the years. And that's why I said uh, previously, they adapted and obviously rewrote, rewrote the books. And uh, yeah, but you must remember 76, 75, uh, South Africa wasn't in a war. They started only then. So all the books that was previously written was experience from the Second World War, which was a not a guerrilla war, it was a conventional war. But most of the stuff that we did um, on the Namibian border was uh, not conventional. Later years, it, it did uh, become semi-conventional, but mostly it was counterinsurgency um, and guerrilla warfare. So, yeah. Well, Bottens, I found that absolutely fascinating. I must tell you again, thank you for your time. But now I need to know, we had a SITREP out, such a Aussie report a few days ago. We were talking about Gideon and his great swim there from Robben Island. Uh, can you give me feedback on that, perhaps? Yes, thank you. Uh, was, we had, um, I, I see that there's, there's uh, about 400 people that have, that have uh, clicked on it, maybe watched it. I've had uh, two positive returns uh, on that. Um, like I say, it's getting close to the time. Uh, and uh, I'm glad and, and, and thankful for those people who actually did uh, commit themselves to, to, to some funds. And like I said, we're not asking a lot of money. It's maybe a hundred kilo, a hundred dollars or so or Namibian dollars or rand per kilometer, that will boil down to $750, Namibian dollars. So yes, we do, we still are in need of some funds. And uh, yeah, if somebody can, uh, can get it in their heart to, uh, to help us there, it, 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 I will be grateful. And this is not something that we're just doing for the fun of it. it uh, I mean, I've been working on it now for a year and a half closely. Gideon has been training for a year and a half. Um, this Sunday, we're going to do the full swim here in Swako. Um, first time that he will actually spend or be in an open sea. Normally, we, when we do swim in the sea, we swim here at Swako at the Mola, which is a little bit more concealed, still sea, but Sunday is now D-Day for that. And... Uh, yeah, and then it's a few, two or three weeks and we have to go off to Cape Town. So, yes, we we um, thank those that, that have looked. Mikey, maybe maybe uh, make up your mind and see if you can, anything will help. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chris. Yes, I'll put the link in for that trip here as well. Uh, and I will urge everybody who's here, come to the party. Let's see if we can do something good here. Buttons, thank you. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. I know this was a short one, but the next one is going to be much longer. And uh, to all of you here, you are not unimportant. I keep on saying that. You'll be surprised how many general officers say to that to me as well, and how many colonels, all ranks actually, sergeant majors, tough people, you know, not people I would have approached in their prime. Um, and they all say to me, if you have a story, please come here, please come and tell us. Uh, let us hear what you have to say. It's important. It's important for you as well. So to all of you, you're welcome here. Again, Bartons, thank you so much. We will see a lot of you in the future as well. I know there's plans for free to battalion association. We'll tell you, we'll tell you people later when, when the time is ready. And until we meet again, God bless. Well, thank you very much. Uh, quite enjoyable. Thanks.